Hi, this is Alan Shea with Our Society Show, and we are here in Altadena with the moderator of today's uh, Women, in Wim Science. Women in Science here in Altadena at the Altadena Library. And Claire Newman is going to kind of walk us through a little bit of what we can expect to see and really get excited because, you know, they look like there's going to be some incredible women on your panel. Um, I'm Decker French. Um, I'm an astronomer at Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. Um, I live up here in Altadena. I've been here for about two years, but I grew up outside of Chicago. Um, so I use observations in the optical, visible light, and also in the radio to look at galaxies and black holes and how they evolve over time in the universe. Hi, my name is April Boyle, and I'm a an marine and environmental scientist that specializes in sharks. My nonprofit's called El Porto Shark and we are dedicated to ocean and shark conservation through research, education, and action. We do a lot of outreach, we do tours, we do all kinds of fun stuff. I'm a Los Angeles native from the west side, and in my spare time I surf, and I'm also the Los Angeles representative and science liaison for Black Girls Surf that teaches people of color how to surf, and also sponsors athletes in Africa for the Olympics and the pro surf. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Marie Group. Uh, I'm an astronomer working at Caltech, I'm a postdoc there. Uh, I'm actually a planet hunter, so that means I'm looking for the planets uh, which are planets around all the stars that are awesome. And it's pretty fun and I'm trying to take pictures of those planets. It's very challenging, but it's really fun. Uh, I grew up in France. Uh, I've been living in the US for six years now with my husband, who's French too. Uh, uh, and in my spare time, I like uh, doing a lot of stuff, going on adventures, hiking, uh, being at the, at the beach or on the sea, and I uh, like to experiment a lot of different things. And oh, also, I love outreach and uh, volunteering for um, the NASA uh, Solar System Ambassador Program. So I'm trying to do as, many outreach, as much outreach as I can with my work. Uh, hi, I'm Brittany, and I am a master's student at York University in Toronto, so I'm a Canadian, but I am here uh, just for the summer to do an internship at NASA JPL, so I've been doing that uh, for just over a month now. Um, my research focuses on Martian water ice clouds, and we observe those using Curiosity rover in the summer and right there. Um, and in about a month and a half, I'll be graduating from my master's and moving out of academia more into science operations, working at Gemini Observatory. Hi, my name is Ann Coleman. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to Philadelphia High School for Girls. Uh, I got my uh, bachelor's degree in physics from Drexel University, and then I moved to California to attend Caltech, and I got my PhD in biology from Caltech, and I never left Caltech, I, except until I retired. So I spent um, uh, all of my career, virtually all of my career, at Caltech doing research and a, a small amount of teaching in the field of mitochondria. And I retired for the second time. I, I retired twice, and the second time was in 2012. And since then, I've been engaged in community affairs and civic activities. I, I sit on the board of Altadena Heritage, and I'm a member of a few committees around town. Hi, my name is Tara Gomez Hampton. I'm a native from the area, went to the public schools in the area, and then went on to UCLA where I earned a degree in biology. And I had a fellowship that allowed me to do research and paid me while I was in school. And so that's how I got really into science um, because I had a paid opportunity to do science as an undergrad. And then I went on to graduate school at Caltech where I earned a PhD also doing biochemistry research there. Um, first I studied aging and then I moved into um, protein degradation over at Caltech. Currently I work as a medical affairs manager for Johnson & Johnson in Irwindale, um, which means that I work hand in hand with the engineers to help them understand human physiology and to think through all of the components necessary for making very safe medical devices. Hi, I'm Nicole Di Pasquale. Um, I was born and raised in New Jersey, and I came out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I went to school in Daytona Beach, Florida, at Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. Uh, I earned a degree, Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering, with a concentration in astronautics, and then 
a minor in applied mathematics. After graduating, I moved out here basically to work for Boeing in El Segundo on satellites. And my last day there was actually uh, August 1st, and I will be starting at NSA JPL on the 26th. Hi, so uh, yes, we're having a panel here today at the Altadena Library on women's science, and we have uh, seven uh, women scientists um, from a whole range of backgrounds, and, and including myself as the eighth scientist. Um, and we're basically talking about um, what it's like to um, have a career in science, what it was like getting into science, what kind of challenges we've experienced, um, and basically uh, sort of what encourages women and young people in general um, to get into science and um, you know what are some of the challenges they've had to overcome and what are some of the great experiences that they've had and what tips they have for, for other people looking to, to get into the scientific field. What led you to your career as a scientist and what most encouraged or dissuaded you along the way? So I had a great role model in high school. I went to an elementary school that didn't teach science um, and so my, my introduction to science really came in high school, and I had, I went, as I mentioned, I went to the high school for girls. But what I, I was most excited about my physics teacher. She was feminine, and she, um, she had a family, and, and she would, could teach science and make it clear and exciting, and I thought, hey, maybe this is for me. And so that was a huge influence, to have a role model who was a woman who was capable and who you know, seemed to live a normal life as well. So for me, it was incredibly easy growing up on the west side. I was always in the water surfing, whatever, and I was completely fascinated by the ocean. And since I was a little girl, I took, much to my parents and grandparents' dismay, I took all my toys apart. <laughs> um, people always call me a marine biologist, but I'm not. My degrees are in chemistry and math. I'm a marine scientist, and I do more of the math and physics part of it. So I was always fascinated by the physics of motion and the waves and watching everything move and everything going into each other. And it took me a little while. I didn't go to college right after high school. Uh, and I was the first in my family to go to college and grad school and didn't have any mentors. So really, my motivation was always the ocean. So similar to Anne, um, my biggest motivator to continue on with science was two teachers that I had in middle school, um, Mrs. Whitney and Mrs. Elliott. They were both women. Um, and they basically saw me, I was, I went to just a normal middle school. Um, there was just public education, you know. Um, but they took me aside one day and they said, you know, Nicole, you're really good at math and you're, you have a really good like, grasp on like, the scientific method and you really love all the experiments we do in class. And I think you should go into science. There's this high school, that it's, an hour and a half away from your house, but it focuses on uh, marine science and engineering, and I think that you would be a really good fit for that. And so they encouraged me to, they told me about this school that I had, would not have known about otherwise, and um, basically they encouraged me to apply, I got in, and the rest was history, and I went on to do systems engineering in high school, which led me to uh, you know, become an aerospace engineer at college and a systems engineer at So my biggest influence was definitely my father. Yeah, I grew up on what I call the Gomez Zoo, the Gomez Family Zoo, where my father had hundreds of pigeons, <laughs> literally hundreds of pigeons, and they're called Birmingham Roller Pigeons. They do flips in the air. You should YouTube it if you've never seen it. It's amazing. And then he had hundreds of snakes, and when you have hundreds of snakes, you need to also breed hundreds of mice to feed those snakes. So growing up on the Gomez Zoo was a huge influence for me. I was always very interested in the living, um, in living systems, what makes things tick. And then my father was always interested in breeding um, birds that rolled better. So he always made these very fancy genealogical charts, you know, tracking his generations and also for the snakes. How do I get beautiful snakes? How do I get albinos? And so that was, this interest that you know came to me because of my upbringing and then was supported by a lot of great teachers that I had particularly some amazing teachers in high school and then it was supported you know further by fellowship programs for instance at UCLA that really enabled me 
to, um, you know, to get into it, to get my hands wet and to understand that science is super fun and there are great career options within it. So my path was not super linear. Oh, that's great. We're gonna, so we're going to ask a couple of questions so the viewers can really get prepared for what they're going to see today. Mm -hmm. First of all, how did this come up? How, how did you get involved with making sure that a panel is brought together to make a presentation with the eight specific scientists that were here today. So I have to give total credit to a wonderful um, library staff member, Uniela Fontaine, who brought together this incredible panel. I mean, I invited one of the one of the people and she found everyone else and made sure that we had real diversity in age and, and, and um, ethnicity and, you know, backgrounds, as they said. And that was awesome. Uni does a lot of great stuff at the library. Um, I'm currently the president of the Friends of the Altadena Library and I love this library. This is the most fantastic library I think on the planet um, or maybe other planets who knows and it's just a great place it has some wonderful programs and and it's really the library staff and the volunteers um, who make these kinds of things come together and make sure that we have these fantastic programs so often. Um, I did grow up with a lot of encouragement from my grandfather uh, to be interested in astronomy and aviation and I was so thankful for that because it led me eventually to come back here but um, as I grew up and it was in high school, I started to think that pursuing a career that was heavy in physics and calculus was not something I was going to be able to do. I was not very naturally gifted in math. Uh, I still don't think I am naturally gifted in math, but um, it really, I, I kind of looked down on myself and didn't think that I was going to be able to pursue it. So uh, I, out of high school, I pursued a different passion of mine, which was photography. And I did that for two years and I got about halfway through my degree program when I realized that I was just not happy doing this for the rest of my life. So I left the program and then I enrolled in night school and I did high school calculus, physics, chemistry, and um, it was tough. And I learned that I have to work a little bit harder at things that are more natural to others, but it was worth it in the end because it allowed me to do the things that I'm really interested in and that are really satisfying for a career. Um, and so now I'm just about to finish my master's, which feels amazing. But I think if I hadn't had that initial inspiration uh, from my grandfather at a young age and then the support from my family um, to stop doing my initial program and do something else, I don't know that I would be where I am today. So it's really nice to have support at home. Yeah. So true. Um, so for me, the, kind of one of the most supportive people was my grad advisor. So I was um, at the University of Arizona in Tucson for grad school for my PhD. Um, when I started, I had, you know, I was very good at like, you know, textbook learning and problem sets and taking courses and, and that. But then going to like, science and trying to ask real questions and um, be more of an independent scientist, that was like this massive gulf of I had no idea how to do that. Um, but I wasn't even sure if, you know, PhD was going to right for me and if this would ever be a thing that I would able to ever be able to do. Um, and my grad advisor was really um, influential in kind of teaching me how to ask questions and kind of challenging my own understanding to seek out um, the gaps in what I was learning, what I was reading in the literature, um, and trying to you know, get me to ask questions, get me to you know, dig deeper into our understanding, and um, get me to a point where I started to ask questions that I, you know, that I couldn't find you know, in some of my papers, things that were actually like on the internet um, in a way that I was Looking back seems like, clear what she was doing, but me as a you know, 22 year old had no idea um, how to go about that. Um, so I think she was, yeah, I, I would not be a postdoc without my grad advisor. Um, uh, it has not uh, always been easy for me. Uh, I'm the first uh, generation um, to go to college and to have a PhD. Uh, I didn't have any person to inspire me in my uh, family, uh, we did science or whatever. Uh, but I always knew, I mean always, almost always knew that I wanted to do um, astronomy. When I was a, a kid, I always, I was always looking for the moon, always, always. And I thought it was kind of normal, like every kid you know, was trying to, to look for the moon all the time. But no, it was, after that I realized that it was not so normal. <laughs> I was kind of obsessed with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I also uh, grew up with uh, those science magazines where I could see very beautiful pictures, astronomy pictures. 
and what we call the Hubble generation. Um, and I was really inspired by all that. So um, I came to the realization very early, like around 12, that I wanted to do that. And then I, I put all the efforts I had <laughs> to in my studies, uh, to, to study math, physics, uh, and go to college, and then to do a PhD, study everything from astronomy, optics, instrumentation, so that I could uh, realize my dream on one day. Um, so I got, I would say, a lot of help from some of my mentor and advisors uh, very early uh, when I was started to uh, work in the, in the field uh, as a PhD student. Uh, but also it's been sometimes on the contrary discouraging because you can meet people who just tell you really bad things like you are not good at science and you should just stop, stop there and do something else and that's really really awful <laughs> especially when you wanted to do that all your life. But I, I have to say that one of my biggest help and support is my husband uh, that I met, I mean, who I met when I was uh, 17 and I've been supporting all the time and he's French, he came to the US with me because of me <laughs> um, and, and I think it's really, really important to have this support uh, to, to be able to, to do this kind of thing, to do this kind of thing. And why don't you share with the viewers now, how are you going to go about making sure that that synergy is there and the women on the panel really connect with the audience? Because it looks like you're going to probably have a packed house here today. Yes, hopefully. Um, so we've come up with some questions that we think are going to really trigger some good debate. Um, and uh, we've sort of gone over them and iterated a little bit and added some. Some of the panelists have, have suggested some extra questions that, to talk about. Um, one of the ones that we added, which was, I, I was sort of, should we, do you think we should talk about this, was about how important outreach and communication of, of science is and how important it is to contact not just the public but policy makers and I think there's going to be some really good um, answers to the, that kind of that question um, from some of our you know panelists because I mean almost by definition people who are on this kind of panel are people who are more engaged in trying to do outreach and trying to get you know communicate that that science is really it's all about evidence-based understanding of, of, of what we're seeing in the world around us and to try and kind of communicate that love of, of finding that and doing that to people and and I think even if you're not a scientist and you're not planning to go into a career in science and you don't have that kind of career it's still you know these are still things that you can apply in in the rest of your life uh, i myself my hobby is writing scripts and novels and i say i always use my uh, research brain to problem solve in my day job and then i use it to problem solve when i'm plotting you know characters and what they do so you can use a lot of the tools that you use as, as a scientist in in the rest of your life and so i, I think there's anyway i think there's going to be a lot of great discussions um, about a whole range of different topics so i'm really looking forward to it what are or were the <coughs> most challenging hardest aspects of your career and do you think any of them have would not be an issue today do you think that things are improving today in terms of i don't know more diverse jobs <laughs> flexibility and that sort of thing well interestingly in the world of sharks it's still an old boys club <laughs> amazingly there's there's a certain amount of us that are studying sharks most of them you see on shark week and it's kind of the same guys over and over. I do know all of them. I'm not going to say anything bad about any of them. But um, Shark Week kind of, the scientist all looks the same. He has a very particular look about him. And that's why the, the mockumentary a few years ago was so easy to get an actor to play the guy who allegedly said that the Megalodon still existed. And I do get there, they're dear by a lot of um, the older fellows. I call it, oh, they're there, dear. You know, when I come up with something, with some of the older fellas, like one of my mentors, in fact, said to me just two years ago, how did you get on Shark Week? Did you hire a PR firm? So it still, <laughs> it still happens today in my field, and it is getting better because I'm kind of at the door and I'm like, ladies, come on, I'm in. <laughs> and I do everything I can to bring other women and girls, and I mean, boys as well because really having a diverse group of people, there are more of us that like the ocean and can surf. You know, my surf break doesn't look like a lot of surf breaks. You know, when I tell people I surf or when I went away to college in Florida, 
they're like, oh, you're from California, you surf, but you're not blonde. And I'm like, yeah, neither is anyone else at my surf break. Everybody who surfs and everybody who studies sharks doesn't look the same. And so I still face some of that kind of thing. Um, sometimes people will look right past me and look at my husband or look at a man at me and, and ask him my questions. And my husband's great. He'll go, she's the one who knows everything. <laughs> and you know, because you know, he's a tall white guy, so they figure he's the one that's in charge, or you know, they got the name wrong, or something like that. So it's still pervasive in the field of science, but it is getting a lot better because a lot of there are a lot of women in marine science, fortunately. There's a lot of women that have higher positions at aquariums and NOAA and all these other organizations, which is is, is great, but it's Still, depending on the field you're in of science, it's still very much the old boys club in, in some respects. And you just kind of have to understand how to um, go through that. You know, I hear some pretty interesting comments every now and then, and you just gotta kind of, okay, and move on with that. Like, I didn't say anything back to the PR for, because there's a 70 year old guy who's getting ready to retire, and. So he won't be around much longer, and then I'm not going to, you know, challenge that at this point in time. But I just, all, all I said to him was, actually, I've been working for a while, so people are starting to recognize me more. So, you know, I have publications, and I do a fair amount of writing and get a fair amount of press, but it still irks people in my field. So uh, that's not to encourage, discourage any young ladies who want to go into marine science because you have me and some other ladies. Well, good. And in, and in closing, so we can let you get ready to, to get up there and get the, the program going, uh, what would be the ultimate hope that will come out of today's uh, panel and certainly uh, to be implemented through the Altadena Library because it can certainly be a, uh, a new platform that will have added value of awareness? So I think what we really would love to get out of today's panel is to basically help not just not just young people actually and not just young women but to help people who have an interest in science of any age or gender or, or anything to get more involved um, think about science as a potential career you know if that's if it's not for you it, 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 it you know it doesn't have to be your career but but maybe there's something that you, that interests you that you can get involved with as a citizen scientist or you know maybe you can just find out more about something you're interested in and as you said you know we're here at the library it has a fantastic selection of books and especially this summer with the reading program which has been all focused on space and and, and exploration there's been a load of programs put together um, and and the friends of the library uh, support you know the funding provide the funding for a lot of these these programs so um, we're really excited I'm really excited to participate in it um, sort of on, on actually be part of it that's something that we're, we're supporting as well financially and and helping to make it happen but it's really the library staff who come and the program committee that come up with these fantastic programs and make sure that they happen and we're really really grateful to them for for trying to do so much for the community wow well we want to just thank you so much for being a moderator and we're getting excited because i know you have some dynamic women on on the panel and i can't wait to hear the questions <laughs> so we want to thank you for your contribution and being a moderator for today's show thank you very much for thank being you. here um when i was in college i was often the only girl in my class and so especially during the more hands-on engineering classes you know, we need to use the bandsaw to cut a piece that for some model you're building. They're like, no, 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 I'll do it. I was like, I did this in high school. It's like, I'm good. I got this. <laughs> and they're like, but you're the girl. I'm like, yes, I am. And I'm still better at it than you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I've had a few experiences like that as well. And then, you know, uh, coming into work, it's actually where I was working, it, it was pretty good. Like, pretty good. There was not a lot of I would say sexism or anything like that. There are a few little things that would happen, like when a chief of staff position opened up, my manager asked me if I would be interested. I was like, why would I be interested in that? I'm an aerospace engineer. <laughs> like, um, and uh, things like I would walk into a meeting and someone I hadn't seen in a while, an older gentleman, had like a, you know, just a paper, like rolled up in his hand like this, and I walked past and he was like, hey, how you doing, Nicole? And like, popped me on the head with it. And I was like, oh, okay, that was weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't have done that to anyone else, but, you know, like, as a young woman, but, uh, you know, like, that's some some of the things that I've experienced, but like, like April was saying, like, that's not to discourage people. Um, know that 
there are a lot more women coming into science and who will have your back and will you know, make sure you're seen and heard and that you feel comfortable in your work environment. I just want to say, I feel like in my field, which is planetary science, it's, it seems like it's a lot better, but I feel like because a lot of the more senior people tend to still be, I mean, there's a lot of more senior women actually, because I feel like the women have gone ahead and done a lot of the work for us, but there's a lot of more senior men as well. And so I know that sometimes I was having to think up who could be on a panel or, or to chair a session at a conference or something. And I would find myself naturally thinking of the people I'd seen do it before, and those were mainly the older, more senior people, and they were the men. And so I think there's a, there's still, I would say in my field, it feels like it's not so overt, because um, I think it's less of a hands-on field, it's more computer, it's more, uh, but I think there's still that, it's more subconscious thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, you can't expect people to think about some things without maybe nudging them along the way. But I think, you know, people who've gone before have done a lot of the work, and I'm very grateful for that, because I fortunately have never really encountered anything that even that, that you guys are talking about. And my dad was certainly completely oblivious to the fact that there would be any, you know, he was like, oh, you're great, you want to do science, excellent, you know, and he'd take me along with him to work and stuff. So he completely did not think of treating me any And we're back, we have one of the I'll make sure. Okay, good. We're back. We have one of the scientists with us, if I may call you that. Great panel, great information. Why don't you share with the viewers, really, what does this mean to you and how important are these type of panels, especially for this community? Mm -hmm. I think these panels are incredibly important because it's a part of doing outreach and it's really, really important that we do our part in sharing what it's like to be a scientist so that we can encourage others to come along on this journey with us. And uh, you know, you guys touch upon a lot of things, but I'm wondering how are we going to be able to implement a greater awareness, especially at a local level, and especially with public, uh, public schools? Mm -hmm. I think, again, it goes all back to outreach. I think to influence on a local level, you need people you know, to put boots on the ground, go into the schools, when I was at Caltech, that was something that I did with an organization, and we need people to continue that on. I know some of those efforts are being continued. Um, we need people really committed to being boots on the ground and working with our schools and doing that outreach. And last but not least, before I let you go, what, what do you feel would be a real uh, strategy that can be um, used to, to take this to another level because it's great when we have these panels and we have these discussions but uh, another story about real implementation mm -hmm. you know I think it again you know goes down to people having a vision for what is the change needed and then being boots on the ground to implement that change so we also, you know, today during the panel talked about some of the tangible things that some of us are doing. Some on the panel have started nonprofits aimed at getting to what they see as the weaknesses that really need to be tapped on um, to open up opportunities. I think we need more scientists doing things like that and doing outreach, working with our schools to really make those tangible differences. Well, we certainly thank you and really appreciate your service because it really elevates the awareness of how important uh, your contribution, your colleagues' contributions, and certainly as an African-American woman and the legacy that you're leaving, thank extremely you. important. So we want to thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.